Okay, hi. I think we'll we'll get started. We're good. Yeah. Um, welcome to Paperback OS. My name is Shuman Basar. Uh, thanks to you all for coming this lunchtime. Thanks also to Seth at the back for setting this uh, little technological island up for us. Um, and thank you to my three guests, uh, Emily, Jim, and Tom, who I'll introduce in more detail in a in a moment. Uh, firstly, if I could ask you to just turn your phones to silent right now, please. That would be appreciated. And, and then secondly, the influence of television. This. The influence of television. Yeah, now, Marshall McLuhan deals with it in terms of it being a, a high a high intensity, you understand, a hot medium, what I as opposed give to for a blood, large sock as with horse manure in it. Which he uses as what linear. do you do when you get stuck or, on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why can't it's I give my maddening. opinion? This is a free country. He, he can give you. Do you have yeah. to give it so loud? I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really, work. Really, really. I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan will have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so yeah. Just let me, let me, let me, come over here, a second. Oh, tell I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong? How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. <laughs> if life were only like that. So, 13 years before his 1977 appearance in Woody Allen's Annie Hall, a 53-year-old professor of English literature with a penchant for dowdy-colored suits and Joycean puns published this book called Understanding Media. His name was Marshall McLuhan. Understanding Media was followed by two other books called The Mechanical Bride, um, sorry, was preceded by two other books called The Mechanical Bride and The Gutenberg Galaxy, 1951 and then 1962. All three of these books and uh, all of the various kinds of writing, publishings, and, uh, and also oration um, produced by Marshall McLuhan were uh, widely considered to be brilliant but also incredibly obtuse. He essentially was describing this new uh, landscape of new media at that time, television, radio, magazines, advertising, and of course, paperback books, as extensions of man. So all these things were not something that were um, separate to us, but were in fact an extension either of our psychical or physical selves. So. The book is an extension of the eye, the wheel is an extension of the foot, etc., etc. And so following this logic, uh, he's able to conceive of the world uh, not as a, as, a, as a kind of field with objects and subjects, but actually a kind of network where electric, elect the electricity that also powers us is the same electricity that powers these various things, and particularly media that we've invented. And this book, uh, Understanding Media, uh, contained a phrase, uh, the length of a short tweet, which went viral way before the internet ever existed. The medium is the message. And by this he meant that the actual message of any media is not the content, but the media itself. In the very same book, McLuhan said that the paperback itself has become a vast mosaic in depth a transformation of book culture into something else. Um, and then, three years later, uh, this book came out. This is the, two, this is the uh, American edition, published by Bantam Press, and the, English, the British edition, published by Penguin Books, 1967. Um, and so this phrase, this proto-tweet, the medium is the, is the message, um, became one of the forces fueling the medium is the massage, 
And yes, that isn't uh, a typo. Uh, the medium is the massage, although Eric McLuhan, um, Marshall's son, there, there are various kind of accounts as to how this happened, but uh, Eric McLuhan claims that it was, in fact, a typo that came back from the printer, uh, and that McLuhan looked at it and said, keep it, I love it. And, uh, and one reason that he loves it is because embedded in, in that word massage are four different, uh, are already four different possible meanings. And so, as I said, he's, he was a kind of, uh, he adored puns, he adored words that had multiple meanings. And so massage is already the massaging of the word message into something else. So we look at it and we think that can't be right. We insist that it's message. It's also mess age, a messy age. It's mass age, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So he kept it. Um, and that says something also about, I think, his, his interest in the fluidity and the, the kind of evolution of, of language, particularly through different kinds of media. So these uh, notions uh, uh, are, as I said, are kind of psychic or uh, physical extensions of man. And they're presented as quick-fire bursts of bold words and fragmented images. Um, so just to give you an idea, that's the first page. Good morning. Uh, and then later, right at the back, you'll discover that that, the thick, that, little, that yolk of egg has been um, printed with the latest printing technology from 1967. So it's something very familiar, but also something slightly strange. And that sets up, in a way, the kind of manifesto of the book. We then the massage and how. The major advances in civilization are processes that all but wreck the societies which they occur, quote from Whitehead. So you can see the kind of collage and also kaleidoscope of ways in which images and text, stock images, images from advertisement. This is actually uh, Jerome Agle as a young child and so on and so forth. And so the book moves almost like a piece of cinema. Those of you who know Eisenstein and the way in which the jump cut is like one of the basic principles of, of cinema. We'll, we'll find this very, very familiar, and so on and so, so forth. So readers were being told this is what accelerated advances in technology and communication are doing to you. You were taken on a journey through microchips and toy trucks, James Joyce and fishnet tights. 1967 was also the year of the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and Guy Debord's capitalist critique of culture, the society of the spectacle. Instantly, the, me the medium is the massage became another touchstone of 1960s pop cool. And just to show you that, I mean, the penguin, it was a slightly different cover, but the insides are the same. This is a very beautiful spread. It for, you know, those of you who love Tumblr will realize it already foresees the kind of formats of, of extreme compression where each individual frame yields what seems to be a very short burst of information. But perhaps what we'd argue is that that's done never at the expense of depth of meaning. So the medium is the massage looked that way because McLuhan was just one part of a team of three. There was the former advertising man, Jerome Agel, who re reinvented himself as a book producer. And there was a New York graphic designer, Quentin Fiore, most famous for designing the numbers on the standard Bell Labs home phone. The two of them craved to take McLuhan's difficult prose and, in Agel's words, comp com comprehensively contract them. And the criteria was that they wanted to make McLuhan understandable to a 10-year-old. Now, this is a book, and in, in fact, a journey or a film on, in paper that can be read very, very quickly. Quentin Fiore described the graphic thinking behind his design as, quote, a dialogue between the computer and the book, which is pretty forward-thinking for the mid-60s. 
Over the next year, eight years, Jerome Egel went on to produce several more of these innovative experimental paperbacks. He worked with architect Buckminster Fuller on I Seem to Be a Verb, which actually takes, uh, some of you may know this already, one of Buckminster Fuller's infamous mediums was the lecture. It was, uh, he used to give eight, nine, ten hour long lectures. And, and so this book is a, a a, a, an attempt to comprehensively contract one of these epic marathon lectures uh, into, a, into a paperback, into a pocketbook. And so it's actually a, it's a, it's a direct address to the reader from Buckminster Fuller. Then there was the counterculture icon, Jerry Rubin's Do It. And there was also, during the making of Kubrick's 2001, Agel worked with Stanley Kubrick in this book, which, and also with Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote the, the, the script, the story, the novel that the film was paralleling. So this book came out just after the film came out. It's also an, a really incredible artifact. Um, and then, oops. Uh, and then the series ends uh, in 1975 with this book, with the uh, astrophysicist, cosmologist, Carl Sagan, book called uh, Other Worlds. At this point, he's no longer working with Quentin Fiore, but you can see that the graphic style is still intact from their work with, with McLuhan. So each collaboration combined intellectual insight with irreverent wit, always packaged in pictorially high-paced pages. The affordable cover price, just over a dollar, made these complex ideas accessible to all. It's a really important point. The size, that of a standard paperback, was there to work with the standard back pocket of most jeans sold in America in the 1960s, something that Tom reminded me a few days ago. So younger and older people's pockets became the book's free distribution system. Right? Also, I think, very, very important and interesting point. So, um, bringing us up to, literally, today, uh, this is a book that uh, Douglas Copeland, Copeland, Hans Ulrich, Obrist, and I have just uh, produced and, and published. Uh, and it's our own kind of experimental paperback, which has been published by Penguin. Uh, here in the in the UK um, with Blue Rider and there's also a, a, a German version and maybe others um, and it's entitled the age of earthquakes a guide to the extreme present and what we wonder in here is the question uh, that's been posed for certainly the last 20 years which is what would McLuhan have made of our always connected world what would he made of the world of in which the internet seems to have restructured everything. The key difference between our book and The Medium is the Massard is that while McLuhan, Fiore, and Agel, they charted the impact of 1960s electric technology and culture, television, radio, advertising, The Age of Earthquake tours the impact of digital technology, and in particular, the internet, on our brains, our relationships to each other, and even changes in our planet. The Age of Earthquakes is also born from an extensive collaboration between a novelist artist, a writer, cultural critic, and a contemporary art curator in the shape of Hans Ulrich Obrist. This is the three of us. We've been 3D printed at Douglas's uh, house in Vancouver a few months ago. Um, and this is our official portrait. We thought that uh, an ex the only appro appropriate extreme present portrait is that of a 3D printed fake marble bust. Um, and another collaborator that's uh, extremely important to the book is Wayne Daly, uh, who's the graphic designer. And, um, and Wayne happens to also be the graphic designer here at the AA, and so he and I have a, uh, both a friendship and a working relationship that goes back a number of years, which we were able to push to kind of new extreme in this project here. Unfortunately, Wayne uh, isn't here this, this afternoon. So, hi, Wayne when he watches it on video. Um, and, and, and I'm not overstating it to say that Wayne uh, is to our book what Quentin Fiore was to the medium is the massage. 
And so what we want to do is update that 67 book to 20, 2015. We needed to change the inputs and see what the, out, what, what the consequences would be on the outputs. And so this has primarily meant charting our current culture of screen addiction, both big and small, either at the desk or walking blindly on the pavement straight into an oncoming truck. Wayne culled visual clutter from these screens and dumped them onto the pages of our paperback. We stole aphorisms, slogans, and spam from the internet, which Wayne then set in the same neutral font designed by Radim Pesco. The font we used is called uh, Union. And what Union is is a combination of uh, Helvetica, which many of you will know, uh, which was the, became the default modernist font of, uh, of choice, particularly 50s and the 60s, and then Arial, which was um, Microsoft's uh, attempt to make their version of Helvetica, because um, if they were going to use Helvetica, they would have had to pay millions and millions in licensing fees, so they made their own, own font, which is Arial, which many of you probably use without knowing that you use it, and Radim has combined these two to make Union, so that's the font that we're using. Again, for us, a kind of collapse between the font the privileged font of the page and the privileged font of the screen. And then the idea is that these excretions that we cull from, the, from various screens transform into a, into a kind of poetry once they're laid out in this, uh, in this kind of uniform way. The bulk of the images come from a process we call mind sourcing. We sent the manuscript to 35 different artists from all over the world. Some were born after 1989 and several were born before 1945. And we ask them to respond with relevant visual work. It's like a collective human search engine with the same strange and poetic accuracies and errors that we know very well. Google tends to return to us. Here are some of the artworks that, that, were, that came back from this search engine process. This is Katya Novitskova, Liam Gillick, Amalia Ullman, and then Hans-Peter Feldman. This image came in from Alex Mackin-Dolan, who's also part of this 89-plus generation that Hans-Ulrich Obris and Simon Kastet have been surveying the last few years, the generation born after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, uh, and the inception uh, of the World Wide Web as we know it. This image came in. It's called Luxury Melted Earth. And already at this point, we've been collecting versions of the globe that date back to the late 60s when the Earth was seen as a whole for the first time and that then went on to inform the ecological movement of the 60s and the 70s, um, on to James Lovelock, Buckminster Fuller, etc. Alex's Earth here, this luxury melted Earth, is a kind of iPhone 6 version of Earth. It's all reflective, infinitely smooth, a puddle of perfection. And, and so this image came in and, and ended up becoming the, uh, the main cover image. This is the American version of the book and the back of the UK version of the book as well. And so I'll just show you a few pages, just to give you an idea also how we start. Starts with a ping and a pong. An email for you, possibly very first, the very best email you've ever received, what would it say? Contents of the lost ark revealed in a stunning set of JPEGs, click now and hope your face doesn't melt off. Premium access members access bonus images and qualify for a Thomas Cook tour of Hitler's Germany. Move to folder. Transporting data now uses 50% more energy than world aviation. This amount will grow and grow and grow. These are images from Thomas um, Trevor Paglin's last pictures project, where he sent up 100 pictures onto a satellite that are orbiting Earth forever. So this is one of the key concepts of the book. We haven't just changed the structure of our brains these past few years. We've changed the structure of the planet. The book then moves through different themes, like perceptions of time, our understanding of, of us, um, politics, money, religion, belief. And um, so all this is done uh, the same, as you can see, the same cheap black and white of the medium as the massage. 
and also of ways of seeing, which we'll look at in a minute. And this is a kind of perverse refusal of the hyperchromatic possibilities offered to us today. And it goes to show that embedded in the DNA of the simple paperback is an enduring technology, an operating system that's resilient and open to continual cultural renewal, absorbing what's around it. Right, there we go. It often takes the medium of a previous era to fully capture the contemporary media and moment we live in as an environment. So now for the interesting part. I've invited three very different but uniquely engaged guests to time travel to the mythical past of paperback ingenuity, as well as help us predict the present, trans present predicament of the format in an age of swiping left and pandemic ADD. I've asked them each to share a few thoughts from their experiences and their respective disciplines, after which we're going to discuss the connections and disconnections and also invite you to join the conversation. So our first guest on my left is Emily King. Emily is a writer and curator specializing in graphic design. Uh, some of her recent projects include edit editing a monograph for the art directors MM Paris and curating an exhibition of the work of the designer Richard Hollis that launched in London, it went to the Pompidou in Paris, and concluded its international tour artist space in New York. As well as being a contributing editor to The Gentlewoman, Emily, Emily writes for a range of publications, including Freeze and Apartamento. Will you please join me in welcoming Emily King? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. I mean, it was fun to gather the material for this. Um, in part because normally when I do research for a talk these days, I tend to kind of search around my own kind of computer files or the internet. And actually it was interesting to walk around my house trying to find where I'd left the paperbacks. I mean, it was a kind of whole different set of thoughts is, you know, what, what was I doing when I last read this book? Where did I think I'd store this book? You know, did I store it with my workbooks? Did I store it with my theory books? And actually, you know, to physically search for a book and try and remember what you were doing when you last saw it. It's a kind of whole different way of thinking about a set of information. Um, I chose, I'm talking specifically about, how's that work? <laughs> there we are, here we are, <laughs> this book. Um, Hazards of Work and How to Fight Them. Um, this is a book designed by Richard Hollis who, uh, who is the designer of Ways of Seeing. Um, when I curated the exhibition of Richard, I asked him which of the books he had designed had made him most proud. And this was always the book that he would, he would pick out. Um, it was published in 1973. It's Worker's Handbook number one. Worker's Handbook number two is called Your Employer's Profits and is a kind of Marxist exploration of how your employer, um, you know, exacts profit by kind of reaping the rewards of your surplus labor, which they kind of subsume for themselves. Um, so they're both kind of left-wing, you know, Marxist consciousness-raising exercises. I mean, Pluto Press was a small independent publisher. It was based in Chalcott Square in Primrose Hill. So, you know, hop back to the old days when there were communists in Primrose Hill. And I think the kind of, the revolution was, was very present. I've, I've spoken to someone, Beban Kidron, the film director's parents were very involved in it, Michael Kidron. And she says, you know, the, the, um, the revolution was a permanent guest at the dinner table. They really did feel that this could happen at any point. Um, the purpose of this book was to be, well, it was meant to be as kind of cheap and easy to distribute as possible. The size, it's, it's um, intended to fit in a worker's pocket. And in the exhibition, we had a kind of set of overalls and we would slip it into the pocket to show exactly. And I don't know, you know how many workers at the machines, at the lathes actually had this in their pocket, but that, that was the idea. Um, and it was made by offset printing and that was just simply intended to be the cheapest possible way 
of distributing it. So there's no kind of real design nicety. Everything is simply there to make it cheap, practical, portable. You know, it's, it's not, in a sense, meant to be sort of challenging in any other way, but simply just be very, very present. Um, if you look at the typesetting, So the kind of choice of graphic style really came from um, tabloid newspapers. And Richard thought that what Merkers read most often at the time were the red tops. I mean, I don't know, that would seem now a very patronizing assumption, and I don't know, but probably then, you know, those things were much more in circulation and kind of much more widely read. And so he thought appropriately, you know, he would set type in keeping with the kind of typesetting patterns of the red tops and that would allow you know, the worker to access information more easily. And so it, the, work, the um, information is very densely set, but there are kind of very clear chapter headings and sections in bold that are meant to help people negotiate. And the other thing Richard has always said, which I think is kind of incredibly radical, is that um, he believes that a role of the graphic designer is to save money. He thinks graphic designers should understand how you can print things economically, you know, how you can fit the most information on a page, how you can get the most out of kind of a certain print format. And actually by hiring a designer, hiring designers shouldn't cost you money, it should save you money, and that really is the role of the professional. Um, I'm not sure, as I said, how many workers actually did wear this in, you know, carry this in their pockets. But it was certainly, it kind of really came to the, its kind of height of attention when um, it was brandished by the Labour opposition leader, Michael Foote, in a debate about health and safety. And um, Richard often talks about health and safety now, actually, because it's become this byword of kind of the nanny state, oh, health and safety, we're all kind of really constrained. But as he points out, health and safety legislation was really invented to keep workers safe. You know, the capitalists will exploit workers to the maximum for their profit and if they're not obliged to keep workers safe they will not keep workers safe because that's expensive and health and safety legislation is simply to protect you from the people who would seek to kind of extract the maximum pos possible profit from you and he and it's still something that he feels incredibly strongly about and actually in addition to this book in his studio he has a number of health and safety kind of brochures and leaflets now, which he finds shockingly bad, stupidly printed, kind of overly extravagant, not something anyone could negotiate their way around. So, you know, the issue, he, he still believes the issue is as relevant as ever. But the last story about this book is that I, um, I didn't actually have a copy. Uh, I didn't keep a copy when I did the exhibition. And so I had to buy one. And I went on, um, online to buy it, and there were several copies available for one pence which is extraordinary. In the end, I bought a copy for three pounds because somehow buying, buying a copy for one P just seemed too small. I couldn't actually believe that if I paid one P for something, I would get the thing, which is quite an interesting kind of double thing on, on book getting, but I got a very nice book for that. Um, so just to mention, I mean, I don't know, how, if, are you going to talk about ways of seeing? Just to mention, yes. <laughs> Yes, um, it's funny. We've, I think we've all brought a copy of it, which is, which is funny. We've all bought our individual piles of books, but we've all brought a copy of this. Um, I mean, Ways of Seeing was a, it's, it's a television series made into book form. It was intended to keep the format of the television series. So more that, say, than Marshall McLuhan, who wants to reflect what happens to culture through television in the book form, Ways of Seeing is a television series in book form as you know as closely as possible it, it's that translation is able to make which explains why it's um it's bold type throughout and Richard picked the bold type because he felt that the boldness was like the kind of declamatory form of TV that that kind of was somehow a typographic equivalent of the television voice um, and this is not the original cover and you'll see various other covers who's got has anyone got the actual no one's, none, none of us have got a first edition. It's like that, but black. The type's black, exactly. 
yeah, there's a very extremely nice picture of it in the bar, actually, yeah. Um, but I'll, but this book was um, very, very strongly inspired by another book, which was um, a 1961 book, a book by uh, Chris Marker, the filmmaker, designed a book in 1961 called Commentaires. It's actually, I, the copy I have, my, my copy, this is another thing, so my copy of Commentaire is currently with Richard Hollis, who has been writing a lecture based on it, so um, I kind of remembered that as I was searching around the house for it. it, it and it is, um, that's the, how it's meant to look. But Commentaire, importantly, intersperses text and image and again I don't think Rich was making a kind of a sort of theoretical point in the style of Marshall McLuhan it was simply that he thought if you are making an argument about an image then that image should always be available exactly where the text is I mean it's a very sort of simple point about comprehension um, so he was inspired by commentaire to kind of do the make the book in this style so that as you kind of get to various points he'll he'll actually show the whole of a painting and then he'll argue about a detail of it and show the detail of it so that you can follow the argument he's making through the text and images very much at the same time in the, exactly the same way as a television program would allow you to sort of follow the argument while you're looking at the relevant image on the screen um, now this was a style that he didn't just exploit in ways of seeing I mean he um, also used it for this, um, the John Berger book, I don't know, The Seventh Man, which is an argument about immigration. And there's one picture that Richard always spread, that Richard always picks out in this, that he's very proud of, which is this page. Here we are. So this is about, um, I mean, really, the, the business of, uh, well, it's helping refugees escape to kind of new countries. And the idea was that often people would take payment but then just abandon the, the people in the mountains or kind of actually fail to deliver them to a safe place. And so what became the practice was that the refugee would take a picture and tear it in half and they would give half to the people who helped them over the border and then they would keep the other half and when they arrived in their destination safely they would send it to their families and so when the person who had the original half the, the person who trafficked them over the border would return to the families and if it matched they would actually receive their payment and so Richard made this design with kind of splitting the um, image between the description of the practice so that you could actually get the sense of the two halves being put together I mean, isn't it quite an extraordinary idea that somehow maybe you would be so, um, I mean, I wonder why you can't just send a whole a picture, but maybe in a sense someone would be distant for you for so long that you would actually need to match the picture, that you wouldn't know it's an authentic picture, which goes to show that kind of these journeys were much more kind of isolating. There was much less communication. They were done in a kind of very different circumstance. Um, and so the, the book, though it's not as exact an argument, it kind of runs in a similar way to ways of seeing in that the argument is made through images and text. Was that published after ways of seeing? It is published after ways of seeing. Yes, it's so 19, the, 1975. So is there next collaboration after this? You know? uh, um, novel G, is there next collaboration? I think it is, yeah. Was G before ways of seeing? I mean, they collaborated a number of times. And most of these collaborations happened in the early 70s, so I guess perhaps these things were going. But also, Hollis would say that it wasn't really a collaboration with Berger at all, in a way. Mm. But we can get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that later. I mean, th what it also shows in this this book is, um, I mean, it's a kind of paperback kind of issue that um, this is a paperback, but it's obviously been made into a hardback immediately. It hit the library, which um, I don't know if that need be. It's only actually been taken out like about 13 times or less for a moment. So it's not, not been kind of removed very often from the library, but people obviously feel a certain amount of caution about allowing paperbacks into a sort of public domain. I mean, maybe they're very kind of private, individualistic things and people, you know, but they, they're not for kind of many hands. Um, and then the sort of the last book in which Richard really used the same format, which is this, I mean, any, graphic design historians or any interested in graphic design, I'd strongly recommend this. I still 
use it all the time just to kind of check things out. And it's a kind of history of graphic design that starts in the late 19th century and runs through to, I think, I think the last bits are in the early 1990s. And again, he uses the format. It's incredibly dense. There's a huge amount of information that's kind of very densely put. And then he used these illustrations exactly in the right spot to, um, to kind of make the argument. And I, th you know, you can see that it's at, at the expense of big glossy illustrations in a sense that he's used small footnote illustrations to make the argument rather than large kind of luscious illustrations. So it's a kind of different way of thinking through the idea of illustrating a paperback. Um, and I should let that point up also. Thank you. We, we're going to, I know we're going to continue a little bit with mm. Hollis, uh, with, with Tom, um, but that's great. And uh, we can un, un, unpack of this, unpack some of this in, in a minute. But I just want to ask you just, just two things, because maybe you could say something about how, I mean, this is quite a radical book, but the, t mm. the TV show itself was quite radical as well at the yeah. time. Could you maybe tell those of people in the audience mm. who haven't seen it what, what, what the TV show was like as well, what uh, made it so the, different? Yeah, the, I mean, the TV show is a, it's a four, five part series, four, five? Each one has a theme. I mean, the first one is kind of about advertising and imagery and advertising. And what Berger does is he compares imagery and contemporary advertising to art imagery and kind of draws parallels between what's going on in advertising and what's going on in art. And I think that was a, I mean, a really completely revolutionary thing to do at the time. And, you know, he, he just sees all images, he treats all images as equal as kind of, you know, way, things that we see and things that shape our culture and things that our culture is, you know, we, we've kind of both, it's the push and pull, they shape our culture and we kind of create them out of our culture. So we produce them from the culture. And I think that was a very, very radical way of seeing art history at the time. And it was obviously set against Kenneth Clark's civilization, which was a much more sort of traditional mm. art historical view. So I think it's kind of two poles of kind of art historical exploration. And there's one, th for me anyway, there's a, I mean, the way it starts is incredible, right? We start this close up of painting, and then suddenly out of nowhere, a knife comes through and s yeah. slashes it. Mm. And I think, for me, what's really uh, important about that show is that he, Berger employs the television screen, makes you hyper aware, reflexively, of the, of the screen as your TV screen as a, as a surface. Yeah. Um, as a surface that's looking at other surfaces, right? That's looking at other paintings and both the freedom and the constraints that a camera allows you yeah. that your eyes don't, et cetera, and all this stuff. And, and that, that direct address that he has to the, to the camera. But yeah. there's something about that. And also, I feel that, you know, if Berger is making you feel hyper aware of the screen, there's something about the pay page here and the fact that it's black and white um, images of color paintings etc mm. yeah. and he's very not just very interested in what you show and what you don't show so he's very interested in the act of kind of focusing on Crop, a particular thing and how you at the expense it. of everything else and how that is kind of a practice in kind of culture at the time was to if you focus on a particular thing then you will read an image in a completely different way than if you allow someone to see the whole thing so that I mean in this section he kind of makes an argument about a single painting by focusing on lots of individual details, yeah. which initially would kind of make you feel very differently about the painting until you reveal the whole thing here. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so next, uh, next up is Tom Weaver. Uh, Tom is editor of AA Files, managing editor of all of the Architectural Association's publications, and teaches architectural history and theory here at the AA's History and Critical Thinking MA program. He writes regularly for books and journals, lectures in schools of architecture internationally, and has previously edited any magazine in New York, which is also a very fascinating format. Maybe you'll bring it up. Uh, so will you please join me in welcoming Tom Weaver. My presentation is basically going to be kind of a show and tell, because I've just sort of raped my bookcase basically this morning. Um, so it was interesting, Emily spoke about the kind of Google, uh, suddenly this um, descent into a world of physical things as, a, as opposed to a kind of digital world of, of um, 
of finding images endlessly through the screen in front of you. Um, and it somehow confirmed to me that, that it's actually much easier finding the physical thing. You know, I just, I just grabbed these things in five minutes, um, staring at my um, bookcase. Um, and rather like my lectures, which do use too many Google images, I've got too many things. Um, but I was going to just go through a series of kind of families, we, families of books in a way, little sort of different genesis of uh, publications. Um, and I'll, I'll end with the kind of more obvious AA things. Um, but partly prompted by Jim's presence, I just thought we'd begin with a bit of the kind of three ages of man that is Penguin, um, partly through their, their kind of nice, uh, the ornithology of Penguin uh, and the tripartite structure of the puffin uh, Penguin's children's books, Penguin, their, fic their then fiction, books of fiction, and Pelican, the uh, non-fiction. So I, um, I asked my mum to send me some of my old puffins. <laughs> so, and again, this is going to be so superficial other than saying, look, here is my copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, she actually found games of Hangman that my brother and my sister were playing stuffed inside of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And again, I'm sure there's going to be an undercurrent of what we talk about today, which is a, a kind of King Canutism against the inevitability of a kind of digital consumption. And we will be defending uh, resolutely the kind of physicality of these things. But, you know, you're not going to find a game of Hangman stuffed inside a Kindle. So. So there, uh, so there's going to be there's going to be a lot of that coming up, um, but you know that I come from a very kind of bookish family, so these were always this was always the kind of currency that we kind of engaged in, uh, whether it's uh, in the form of books. So these are real little palimpsests and kind of totems of my childhood. Um, my sister has pinched other copies, and my brother some too, but I've managed to hold on to some. Um, so. It, it begins with Puffin. And again, I quite like the ornithology of it all. It's somehow the, it's a bird that seemingly is easier to kind of comprehend emblematically before you get into a slightly more complicated bird in the form of a penguin, the bird that doesn't really fly. Um, and from my, the penguins, I just bought, again, this is so superficial in the sense that it's just a kind of visual history. I brought in some of these amazing um, penguin poets. Um, that Penguin produced um, from the 30s onwards, um, which is a series that I often kind of use, uh, just sort of reference in terms of their graphics and their covers in the work that I do with A files. Shall I swing these the other way around? And as with all of my books, it used to be the case that, you know, I'd have lists of these things, like in my wallet, that I'd carry around with me just in case I popped into a bookshop to find, to see if there's one I was missing. But now, kind of tragically, you don't find them at all, because there are no second-hand bookshops. And it's somehow it's sort of cheating to just get them on the internet, you know, if you can't find, if you're looking for the Thomas Hardy, and you're like, just to buy it on the internet is totally cheating. Um, now, weirdly, the only kind of repository for that is Amsterdam, the kind of second-hand bookshops of Amsterdam, which is still totally thriving, partly kind of fueled by a kind of emigre American pot smoker who sort of their only skill seems to be their ability to buy interesting second-hand books, which they then sell. Um, so if you want to buy any of this stuff, Amsterdam is the place to go. Um, and again, so a, a, another sort of set of families um, and actually, how one categorizes these things in one's library is always quite interesting. You know, I keep thinking of that great, uh, that wonderful essay by Benjamin about his, um, about his library and how to organize a library. Um, and it, would, it makes me return endlessly to the, um, the medium, is the message kind of um, anthem that, that you established this whole event with. And it's one I'm constantly, I don't know quite whether I, I'm totally for that or totally against it. And in a way, many of the things I've done, um, yeah, I'm a schizophrenic, you know, that I, uh, I do both. Uh, as you'll see, some of the stuff I do with files is entirely antithetical to the medium as a message, in the sense that it believes in the message, not the medium at all. It believes in content. Um, but then when I look at books like these on my bookcase, you know, they're, they're categorized and they're shelved by the medium, by the book. 
So I keep all of my pelicans and my penguins together because they look because they look cooler like that. You see those t turquoise spines of the pelicans. Um, so it's a kind of it's some sort of test of allegiance whether how you actually categorize them. Certainly with nonfiction, whether they get split according to the author or or aggregated in terms of the actual physical nature of the book itself. Um, but again, the bellows, exactly like the um, the penguin poets, are things that I'm endlessly on the lookout for, just to assemble more of the bellows. And I try, and um, I read a lot of fiction, so I try, but I try and kind of rein my curiosity to read another one in until I've bought the book, until, or until you've found the book. But increasingly, that's getting difficult. Um, in terms of the, the pelican aspect, the non-fiction aspect of, um, of, of uh, Penguin's kind of uh, enterprise, I just brought these Freuds in, um, which was a series that uh, Penguin did in the 70s. And, it, and it's, again, back to that idea that, Schumann, you mentioned earlier about the notion of accessibility, which would be another kind of theme that is so uh, important to me. Um, not simply the accessibility of the object, the physical object, but of actually the contents and the way the contents are communicated and the accessibility of the ideas. Um, so there came a point in the 70s when Penguin was able to sort of buy out the copyright from um, Hogarth that controlled the Freud estate. Famously, if you wanted to read Freud's work, you bought the standard edition, which is a 24 volume hardback in this famous pale blue color. You see, all, all psychoanalysis have it on their shelves. It's like a kind of barbershop pole. It, it identifies that they are an analyst. Uh, so it is a kind of uh, yeah, an emblem of their allegiances and a, and a kind of professional kind of benchmark. Um, but suddenly, and you know, to buy it costs you know a thousand pounds. There's this famous psychoanalytical bookshop in London, Carnac Books, that sells rather like the Le Corbusier is over complete. They know that they're going to sell, you know a certain number of copies every year as more analysts get finish their training. Um, but suddenly in the 70s, it, suddenly, it was a, avail, available as a paperback. So Freud became um, available to the common man, common woman. Um, and, and with it, intellectually, you see this sudden uh, explosion of, of uh, and dissemination of his ideas into a kind of wider popular conscience. Um, um, this has happened again. It's gone round a second time. A friend of mine, the analyst Adam Phillips, has recently done with Penguin another version of the complete works of Freud um, with um, new translations for each book and commissioning a new introduction to each one. Um, so in a way, there's a sort of, within Penguin itself, there's this sort of palimpsest of a kind of reinscription over a an earlier project of their own. And then the last ones, though, I just wanted these are the. This is a series of books that aren't my own. These are. I, this, this is freaking me out. These are. I'm doing a piece at the moment on in AA Files on the architectural historian Robin Evans, um, who was an AA student and an AA tutor, who died tragically young um, in the early 90s, and um, he wrote two of these wonderful books on drawings. And um, the piece I'm editing is, in a sense, a, bio, a, bio, a biographical analysis of his work. Um, and in particular, he did this, his main doctoral work, and his first kind of stance intellectually was to look at the prison and the panopticon. Um, but interestingly, he did that before uh, Foucault started to uh, write about the panopticon. You know, there was a, every, every, everyone else was writing as soon as uh, Discipline and Punish came out, but uh, Evans was writing before. And he got into the idea of that basically through the Pelican paperback. Um, and he was reading all of this sort of anti-psychiatry books. Um, and he collects, and his widow is, lives in North London, and I went to see her last week. And she sits still, her living room is still his library. And she said, well, you know, borrow anything you like. So I did. So these are Robin Evans's books. Um, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of wonderful that you can do this. And, and he, interestingly, did not shelve them by medium. He shelved them by message. So R.D. Lang is shelved under L, you know. Um, Owen Goffman is under G. Uh, they weren't, as, as any superficialist like myself would do, be shelved under their color or their size. Um, but again, also, interestingly, when you start flicking through them, you, you, 
suddenly you get things like, you know, holy shit, here is a library ticket card filled out by Robin Evans asking for another book. So it becomes a piece of archaeology, um, another take that Kindle moment. Uh, so I'm looking at Evans' signature, writing out a library strip for another book. It's also in this book by Skinner, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, got a lovely little sort of, you know, notes in the margin on it. And it's sort of tremendously great, interesting, you know, that he's highlighting certain phrases that he agrees with or disagrees with just like anything else and then he's writing these comments. So, um, again, archaeologically, one could almost construct the whole silhouette of this figure through the... Um, these sort of anecdotes and little notations he's made to himself within the body of the marginalia of another publication. So it's the accessibility of Evans through the accessibility of the paperback. Um, so that could never have existed. You know, he, he, he wouldn't have existed intellectually. You know, he came from very humble um, circumstances and these are the only books he could afford. Um, he, he lived uh, for a long time in Romford, so he was getting these books from the W. H. Smiths in Romford, um, and then it is not. It's not. His wife has a funny story that he 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 was looking for a book by Albert Camus, and he he asked for a book by Albert Camus, and because uh, he'd never kind of heard his name before, he'd only seen it. Uh, but I met, uh, the woman in the desk in Romford corrected him, but it's kind of heartening that the woman in the desk in Romford knows how to pronounce Albert. Um, and then just before I hit the AA stuff, um, again, these are just nice other little things that I've got on my shelf at home and things I collect. And it's interesting, again, Emily was talking about Chris Marker. Um, Chris Marker is a absolute hero to um, Richard Hollis's and to many other people, uh, me included, um, initially through his work as a filmmaker. Um, um, and in particular, his kind of pioneering of the idea of the essay film, you know, the film as a kind of text, the film as a narrative of a set of ideas. Um, but a kind of as a sort of prelude to all his filmic work in the early 50s, just for four or five years in the 50s, he worked as an editor for this French uh, publisher, Soil, where he produced this series of books, um, on, uh, Pity Planet books, which is basically books on countries. Um, and he did the design and the editing of these books, and they are fantastic. Um, just, and again, you can really see where uh, Richard is coming from when you look, start looking through these books. I'm sure, sorry, it's going to be upside down, but it's this kind of, uh, again, here's something else that you find. Look at that. Um, um, but with, interestingly, with, with, um, with Chris Marker, it, is, it isn't quite so aphoristic. It is, you still see a kind of the thread of a narrative of, a, of the way he's writing um, essayistically. Um, but, but in terms of the images, it's incredibly kind of contemporary, you know, the way it's actually laid out and the graphics, the full bleed, the, uh, the use of images. Um, so there's two separate, in a sense, narratives. There's a literary narrative and there's a visual one, which is, you know, really stimulating. I mean, uh, Richard, uh, when I had the conversation with him, he, he did, one thing he did mention is that he, he made a pilgrimage to see uh, uh, Chris Marker, um, and he'd got his address. But uh, Chris Marker is, isn't his real name, that's his uh, nom de plume. It's, he's named after the Marker pen, so. Um, and when he got to the address, he realized that he didn't know his real name, so he didn't know which buzzer to press. So it was like a real, oh, bugger moment. And because he didn't, you know, obviously there's no phone or anything, he, he had to go home. That was it. <laughs> exactly. And then had to sort of write to him again, saying, what actual number buzzer is it? Um, and then lastly, again, in terms of another family of books, um, these are these Secker and Warburg books that I've always loved and used to buy just around the corner on um, Great Russell Street. There was a fantastic uh, film uh, bookshop um, where I used to get these things. Um, and they're paperback books that deal with a very visual media medium, um, um, each one on a kind of filmmaker um, or on a kind of thematic within film. And, you know, it, as I, I know as an editor and as a commissioning editor how difficult it is to sort of uh, graphically represent film in a magazine, something so, so 
fluid and animated within the notion of the still. Um, but these books do it so well and so elegantly um, that they've always been something I look to. And again, you know, it's that sort of great clapperboard spine of these books. Um, but then lastly, just sort of turning to my A-file stuff, um, or before that, I mean, obviously, so much of what we do is, is endorses the idea of the paperback book. We are wholeheartedly a kind of physical uh, dig uh, analog publisher, much, much more than we are um, a digital one. We, we produce very, very few e-books. Um, and the, I'm always mindful of the fact that we're a school, so we, we need to be producing things that are accessible um, to the widest possible market. Um, and these being a case in point, this sort of famous, these words books that we do, which are a, a kind of homage. I mean, Wayne and Zach could tell you more about the kind of nuances of their graphic design. But that, to me, at least, they seem to be a homage to two things. One is the classic penguin, I'm gonna pinch one of Jim's, the penguin paperback, which has a sort of image section within the middle. Uh, and then it's just bookended by all of the text. So similarly, the, the word series that we developed which proportionately is modeled on the kind of Levi jeans pocket so that it can fit in into that distribution system that Shimon was talking about. Um, but uh, this series of books has their, an image section at, at the back, highlighted in the color, and then, so you repeat mini images in the body of the book are repeated at full size or uh, full bleed size at the back of the book. Um, but it's also, to me at least, a slight homage to kind of French style books, uh, where if you take off the jacket, the kind of whiteness of it. I had this supervisor at Princeton, a French guy, whose, whose whole bookcase at home his, of novels was all of those amazing Gallimard um, books, you know, entirely albino, uh, where you can see a whole white out um, bookcase. Um, but these have proved to be incredibly successful. I mean, it partly shows the kind of entrepreneurial wisdom of Brett, whereby he loves the idea of things in series, so that regardless of who the author is, people simply buy the next one because they like to rack them up on their bookcase. They just want the gold one, regardless of that it's by Sylvia Levin. Um, we've also endorsed a, a kind of, a, a, this is the sort of bargain basement end of the kind of market where we've done stuff with these sort of slightly more print on demand style books and these are the cheapest books we, we, we've done. These cost 50p each to make um, and they're sort of template books that uh, the size is dictated by the printer and they, um, the printer we work with um, and they are alone amongst all the books we do in being too cheap. Um, that All of our books we do a calculation whereby we sell them for three times the cost of making them and in nearly every instance, we fail to uphold that calculation. We're, it's more like two times. But for these, we couldn't sell them for one pound fifty, three times 50p, so they are unbelievably cheap. But again, it shows the kind of resourcefulness of the, pa of the paperback, that you can uh, distribute something, produce something, make it available and accessible um, in ways that are much more immediate than, than seemingly the web. You know, turning a words book into an e into a Kindle uh, is actually a rather onerous project. And then, lastly, I just wanted to end with the, um, I mean, A files, which is my kind of um, bread and butter job here, is of course a paperback, but it's never really, I'd never really conceive of it, conceive of it as that. Um, but the kind of centerpiece of A files, or the, the two things, the things within each issue that I like best are the conversations that I commission which are always um, biographical, basically, presenting a life. And Richard Hollis was one of those lives that we did. Um, and the kind of material I was getting, I was so kind of pleased with it. And partly because the conversations themselves had been shame, shamefully kind of, kind of plagiarized from the model of the Paris Review, the great kind of literary magazine, which has these conversations with writers. Um, that I wanted to do a kind of anthology, pulling out you know, the first um, five years of A. Files conversations into their own book, partly because it was the easy, an easy thing to do. They'd all been edited and, and published before, and I could just package them. So with my designer, um, John Morgan, we developed this model of another little paperback. There's actually, if you hit that um, 
PDF on your screen. Um, John sent me just some of the images that, um, can that go full screen? These are some of the references that John and I were looking at. Is that happening? Um, the book series itself, we published them in three different colors as a cheat, really, to make them look as if the series was longer than one. It's the same book. We just packaged it in three different <laughs> colors. Um, but we were looking with John. We were looking at these, often these German uh, titles. Um, we tried initially just to shrink A files down proportionately um, and to see if that would work, but it didn't. Um, it wouldn't hold the text properly. Um, so we developed this sort of thin, chubby little model. Um, again, modeled on all of these things that John was, um, John and I were looking at. Um, and it shows you that if you strip out um, the, co the images and run the text in this sort of single column, um, it, really, it really works. You can really get a lot of text in and actually read through all of these different lives. And, and this, for example, would be my kind of riposte to a kind of McLuhan mediumist message that, um, this is the message, this is all about the content, it's all about the life within it. It isn't in any way about its packaging. As lovely as these things are, um, I'm interested in the ideas and the lives that one actually absorbs through reading this material. That I don't want to always ape a kind of uh, 15 second sort of blip verb kind of idea of how one absorbs knowledge. I like the idea of a kind of long form essay or a long form text that it takes you a while, but actually delivers a lot. It packs a punch. Um, so this is something that I'll continue to do. And when, I, when I've aggregated another anthology's worth of, of uh, conversations, then there'll be another round of books. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And uh, we're going to um, move to our final uh, guest now. And it's great that uh, Tom introduced um, some of these uh, classic Penguin titles from the uh, 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. So our, our final guest is Jim Stoddart. Uh, Jim has been art director at Penguin Books since 2001, where he oversees and designs for Penguin Classics, Alan Lane in particular, and Pelican Books. Um, and it's been our great pleasure to, these last few months, uh, working uh, alongside Jim uh, in the production of our of our book, um, which we very much uh, hopefully not too egotistically uh, see in in a, in a tradition that the Penguin Books uh, not only invented but has kind of continued uh, to this day. So, uh, will you please join in welcoming uh, Jim Stoddart? Thank you. Um, thanks for uh, coming, and uh, um, I'll keep it short now. I think I've covered a lot of things, and uh, um, basically things I can add, just kind of expand on, on what uh, Emily and Tom said. Um, I think probably there's a key, there's so many factors to uh, this subject area. I mean, it's a really rich uh, theme of, of conversation, uh, history of uh, paperbacks and imagery through paperback design. Um, I've been at Penguin Books since 2001. Penguin actually now is a much bigger company than it's ever been before. It's now called Penguin Random House. Uh, there are many different divisions and therefore a handful of different art directors that, uh, that deal with book covers and so on. Uh, fortunately, uh, I'm in Penguin Press and we deal with a lot of Penguin brand related material. For, in, for instance, Penguin Classics, uh, Penguin Modern Classics, uh, very recent reinvention of Pelican Books. Um, and a couple of other lists, uh, Alan Lane Hardbacks, which is a kind of uh, intelligent non-fiction, kind of um, smart thinking kind of uh, imprint, uh, and particular books, which is uh, in a kind of, they're just meant to be beautifully crafted books with interesting, interesting projects. Um, there's so much to talk about, but I, I feel like, you know, probably all uh, tired, but I'm gonna just talk very briefly about uh, this little series that includes uh, Ways of Seeing and um, uh, Medium is the Massage. Uh, 
so ways of seeing, uh, as we've talked about a couple of times here today, uh, perpetually a bestseller. It's on all the right lists. It sells uh, brilliantly every year. Um, and I was aware that Penguin has a reputation for, doing, for having a great design history. Um, when you analyze it a lot, it's, it's mixed, you know, it's not everything is brilliantly designed, but there, there are moments of glory. And um, it, it was on my mind a few years ago that it'd be great to have a, a series uh, that were design focused, um, that celebrated a little bit the, those, some of those paperbacks that, uh, that, um, that celebrated design. So Ways of Seeing was an obvious uh, starting point. Um, and also Medium is the Massage had actually fallen out of print. Um, seems hard talking about it today as we've, we've all been uh, celebrating it, but um, so through the 80s and 90s, it kind of, um, I've got the, uh, just to remind you, oh, something fell out of it, which is a nice thing. Is that gonna work there? So just as a reminder, that's the uh, 1967 cover. Um, and sort of understandably through the, through the um, 80s, 90s, this is, you know, relatively old fashioned scheme, constantly, people are looking forward to new media and, you know, at that point, perhaps this just seemed irrelevant, you know, it dropped out of favor. Um, and I think this cover is particularly of its moment. I mean, it's, it's incredibly of its moment. I'd, so anyway, as we've talked about, the insides are a kind of feast um, of incredible imagery um, and design. Um, and there are a couple of other books that I've managed to find um, from the archives. Uh, what was it? Um, Bruno Minari's um, uh, Design as Art, which is, uh, again, a, a really lovely kind of essay on um, drawing and bringing that through to design. It's a very rich, visually rich book uh, from the 60s. And, um, so, I mean, as Tom was saying, there's, a, there's a, always an interest in series of paperbacks. Um, and it seemed, it was an uphill battle to a certain extent to bring ways of seeing back, uh, to, to bring uh, Medium is the Massage, um, designer's art, back with their existing covers. I don't have the existing covers, I'm sorry for, I don't have the existing covers for Bruno Minari and, and others. But um, uh, having them as a, as a visual collection seemed like a very strong thing to do. I was pushing uphill a little bit with the idea of it as well. I managed to get a, the junior editor to um, get on board. In fact, Kristen Harrison is her name. She was a junior editor at Penguin then, back in 2007. She's total managing director material, and, and she's since left Penguin and started her own company, uh, Curved House, to prove the point, um, which is doing very well in art publishing. Um, and she managed to get the re-establish re the rights to the medium is the massage um, and Bruno Minari and we, and we also put Susan Sontag's on photography into this series uh, and we, we're continuing with it actually so we're also publishing a couple of other John Burgers into this series and um, uh, Nairn's London which uh, looks like this. This is, actually, this is actually the original cover so we're constantly, I'm breaking the rules really all the time instead of um, reinventing this cover I just I just feel like this is such a great cover <laughs> that just had to exist, but it's definitely part of the series and it kind of all ties together like that. Um, so um, I asked uh, Simon Aerith at Yes Design to come up with a look, a series look, if you like, for these design books. Um, and that's what he did. Um, possibly controversially, uh, updated uh, the cover of Ways of Seeing. Um, which we've talked about the, the great skills of Richard Hollis, uh, but that's not the original, that's not the original but it, and uh, uh, yeah, I've got three different ways of seeing, but um, it's just important, I think, just to have a moment where you can really celebrate uh, a series and, you know, as I say, ways of seeing is always sold well, perpetually, as much because of Richard Hollis's design work inside, uh, you know, it's on designers lists, uh, uh, sorry, student designers lists and so on, and, and artists. Uh, the content, as has been discussed already, is um, uh, incredibly informative about, you know, literally how you can look at art 
and advertising and design and obviously all the hidden messages that you can find within. Um, and then obviously the design itself is its own art. So, you know, th th that's why it survived as this, this great piece. Um, but in the, in, the, in the promise of doing something uh, different, uh, we've, we've updated the, the typography on the front a little bit. And uh, I don't think everyone is entirely happy. But uh, what's beautiful about it is that this, now, this series looks really great, and shops really support it well. And we, we sell uh, a lot more of these books uh, each year than, than we've ever done. Um, so it's been great to do that. And, uh, you know, I feel proud about that moment. Um, I don't know what else to talk about, really. I think just to, um, just to continue the theme of some other books, um, obviously we've, we've worked with Schumann and co. on, on this book. Uh, it was really exciting to have these guys come in and say that, you know, Medium is the, is the Massage was a kind of inspiration point. And actually, it's a, it's a oh, I don't want to plug it, but <laughs> it's a great, oh, it's a great book. <laughs> and actually, when you, when you get through it, you, it's totally uh, guided to the extreme present. It's really great. It's exactly how I'm sure Medium is the Massage would have appeared then to us now. And the fact that paperback is the, is the chosen medium is really exciting. Um, so I have a, just a question that uh -huh. prompts you on that, because um, we didn't want to do, for us it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an act of nostalgia, it was uh, quite the opposite to suggest that the paperback, like we've been discussing, is, uh, is an extreme present, it's always been an extreme present medium, uh, it always finds itself, it always finds its relevance, and it finds its form of relevance at every point in time um, from, its in, from its inception and, and conception. And would you say that, um, uh, that I mean, I, I have a question whether in your 15 years or so that you've been at Penguin, um, was there a time in, those, in the last 15 years where, where Penguin went through a kind of, a kind of anxiety attack at the advent of the, uh, of the Kindle and then the iPad and the, and the tablet? Um, and did that anxiety, how did that manifest? Because Tom, Tom mentioned the fact that A, publications has remained resolutely analog. Uh, you have chosen to not subscribe to the, to the anxiety necessarily. Um, there are a few more e-books that are being done. Um, but have we, my question to you, Jim, is that in the last 15 years, had there, had there been a panic moment in Penguin? And if there was, are, we, are you in a kind of post-panic moment where you can now basically say with quiet assurance that the paperback is here to stay? Um, that's a really interesting question. And um, to a certain extent, yes, I think panic is maybe an extreme uh, uh, word for that particular thing. There was a, there was a very rapid move to um, engage with e-publishing and so on. And actually, I'm sure across all publishers, we had to work very quickly to really kind of um, build that in to our publishing plan. So we do sell a lot of e-books. Um, you have to remember that Penguin is a commercial publisher, and uh, we, we print and sell mass market books. Uh, you know, the, this selection is, is a, a select, it's a select market, you know, which I'm very keen to broaden. Um, but the bulk of our books are fiction and, you know, other popular non-fiction and so on. And really, we're, our job is to push authors and content to as many people as want to read it uh, and any format. Um, we're publishers, we're not printers, if you see what I mean. Um, but I think there was definitely a moment of, of interest with some book, bookshops going under and so on with uh, um, all sorts of things. I suppose Amazon has affected things and also e e you know, e-books. Um, but I, as you went on to say in your question, yeah, I think it's definitely stabilized, actually. And um, we were talking the other day, actually, that, you know, you could say there was a moment where, a year or two ago, where there were a lot of Kindles and, and e-book readers on the tube. Um, and I dare say, I mean, it'd be interesting to what some of you here think, that actually, I think that's kind of <laughs> a moment has passed with that, actually. I, I don't know if I'm trying to 
read into it too much or will it or something, but I certainly noticed more paperbacks back on the tube again. And I think in a way it's just the, the whole medium of the paperback is so ridiculously convenient. Um, and of course you get to keep it at the end, you know. I, I love digital products um, and, you know, we've all had our own probably journeys with um, digital music and so on. But uh, I do... I do resent losing files, you know, you lose songs on your iPad, you lose, um, you know, you lose files all the time. And this idea of just um, always knowing where your books are is, it's a fundamental thing, isn't it? I did a talk at the LCC a couple of years ago about, uh, about this subject and focused on the idea of things, that actually it's human nature to want to hold things. Um, books are ideas and, um, you know, woven woven stories, but and to that extent, you can read them in any format. But I think really, the the thing aspect of a book, particularly a paperback, maybe is um, is just always going to be there. I, I really don't doubt it now. And Tom, I was wondering whether I mean, actually, interesting. I had a conversation with Brett and I with the CEO of Penguin a few years ago, and he was very he was he said something very interesting, which was that uh, so his prognosis was that the you know, the, the, the digital revolution, if anything, was going to bolster publishers like AA publications. And that basically you, what was happening, and I'm going to do a straw poll in a minute with, with, with you guys, but when it comes to just, when it comes to our thirst for information and wanting information now uh, as soon as possible and then probably forgetting about it in, in, in half an hour's time, uh, that's where the electronic uh, device and electronic medium uh, has prevailed and will continue to prevail. But that actually, what Jim was just saying about the covet covetedness of, of things, um, that once it's like the, 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 the book or maybe even the newspaper it could surrender its obligation to be an information deliverer. Um, but then it, it's not it's not like it was uh, being completely eviscerated. And this is, a, and, uh, and here we can bring McLuhan back in because I think what he, he said, and I think it, and that's why I asked about this anxiety, post anxiety kind of thing, is that you know, every new media basically puts pressure on the old media. Um, and it, in a sense, will exhibit the, both the strengths and the weaknesses of that old media. And if that old media is purely weak, like the CD, for example, we were talking about this, the CD and the genealogy of music media, I think. Is, is weak. I mean, the CD is gone. But of course, people still buy vinyls now because there's something else to the, the quality of the vinyl, not just as an object, but even sonically. We know that. Um, and so that seems to be the case to, with me with, with the book that um, we, we realize that the book isn't just an, an, an information vessel, it's so many other things. Like, that's that business of flicking through, for example. And no matter how, how sophisticated the tablet, or you will never be able to replicate that. And I don't say that nostalgically. I just think technically, phenomenologically, you can't. You know. So I wonder whether you, you've, again, if you, PA Publications has remained resolutely analog, but whether you, you've seen in the last how many years that you've been here, um, actually a kind of, I don't know, your, your, your readership, your grow, your market even grow as, as uh, sales of iPads and Kindles have grown as well. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, I wouldn't put it down necessarily to a readership, but I would uh, contextualize it within the idea of a school, that we're also a publisher built into a school, and not just any school, a school of architecture. So it's the, you know, in, in and now, it's this rather antiquated idea, but architecture, in many ways, is a business that manifests itself in a physical thing. And the tactility of that, the, the aesthetics of that, the style of that, the concreteness of that I think is is always a kind of the middle of that solar system and the book then is a is one of the one of the things that sort of um, alludes to that physicality um, and also in the way that a, that a book a physical book becomes a kind of mon, uh, mnemonic you know a way of actually remembering things and containing things rhetorically just like a building does a building historic the history of architecture is a history of of language and a history of inscribing ideas into the thing that we may call a building. Um, so there seems to be a total kind of um, synthesis between the the kind of object that we're circumnavigating here in an architecture school, the building, and our own relationship to books 
that are resolutely physical, that are meticulously designed, and that celebrate their own tactility um, over and above notions of a kind of appealing to the vagaries of the market. Um, because our market is a kind of, is a, stu is, is a studenthood, or is the kind of wider alumni th of the association of the club of the AA. And, and Emily, I wanted to ask you whether in your, as, a, as uh, your role as a design critic and someone that is, um, either surveying or measuring how gra graphic design has been changing and continues to change. Do you, do you find with uh, contemporary graphic designers, um, I mean, it's in, in a way easier to plug into the, like you, you picked up uh, Richard Hollis's history of graphic design. Um, as, a, as a young graphic designer today, um, I could see myself wanting to make a statement by making a book today yeah. because I, I plug, I, it's much easier to plug into those histories and genealogies of design. Well, it's interesting. When I, when I started um, looking at graphic design, when I started teaching graphic designers, which was in the early 90s, <coughs> oh, sorry, terrible cough, <coughs> all graphic designers wanted to design record covers. And now um, all yeah. graphic designers want to design books for artists. Um, I don't know quite wh where this kind of shift has come from, but it's certainly the case. Um, I think... Uh, not, sorry, not websites. They don't want to... They don't... No, they don't want to design websites because, I mean, of course, if you design a website, you don't have full control because when it's opened on someone else's computer, you have to sort of deal with the parameters they have. I mean, more and more you do, I guess, now that type various typefaces embedded and these are the sort of things that are still changing quite fast. But I think designers are quite controlling. They want to control how things look. And um, so websites aren't the most appealing thing to design. I mean, of course, they are kind of huge challenges. I mean, I, I read a Kindle all the time. I, I have a Kindle always on the go, and I mean, I've got the two going parallel. Um, it is for us, they are incredibly useful for reading really long books on holiday. I mean, you just, you can't beat them. It is really annoying how bad the interface is. And I do wish that someone would improve that. And I, th I don't think, you know, I don't think you can just say it's just this sort of degraded form, there's no design possibility. Obviously, someone could improve the design of the Kindle. They could improve the navigation of the Kindle, which remains absolutely appalling. Um, you know, I, and I'd quite like someone to do it. I, I don't think you should just sort of say this Kindle stuff is crap and these yeah. printed things are fab fabulous. I think the two need to kind of go alongside each other. I've won, I mean, the, interestingly, the books I can't read on Kindle are sort of anything with a sort of real sort of poetic input. I was trying to read Deborah Levy's Swimming Home on a Kindle. Complete disaster. It's a very short book. Words kind of really have to sort of hang there. And actually a Kindle just suits a book that you rush through. And I think poetry doesn't work on a Kindle. I don't know if any anyone has Does anyone read poetry, poetry on, a on a Kindle? Has anyone managed to read poetry on a Kindle? Yeah, no, so I've got a few questions. Uh, here. Uh, again, I, I think we, we must be wary of making any form of sweeping generalization. We're always embedded in the generation that we belong to, of course. Um, but anyway, my first question to, to, to all of us here, uh, who, who stopped buying uh, physical newspapers? One, two, three, four, ah, interesting. So, okay, so the majority... Where is that? Well, does that mean everyone who didn't put their hand up? You, how are you reading? Are you saying you're reading a your newspaper just online? Yeah. But you're not paying for it, are you? But I, I, I assume some people. I've stopped buying physical newspapers. For Okay, yeah, that's fine. Who stopped buying hardback books? No one? Everyone's being, still buying hardback books. Who stopped buying paperbacks? Interesting. And, uh, and of course, the last question is now redundant. Has, if anyone's stopped buying all physical books? No. Okay. So we're obviously very pro. We're, we're <laughs> preaching to the converted, uh, to the converted here. Um, I could take well, one or two questions if there are. Yeah. Um, I recently had, when, two weeks ago, I went to Tirana, and one of the things that we were lucky enough to see was the old communist dictator's house, Enver Hoxha. And every Albanian family, pre the fall of communism in 1991, had to buy a set of his books. And to not do so was to risk being sent off to a prison camp. And they were the most terrifying, they were that sort of dark red, leather bound, 
emotional, the emotional connection that we all have with those books on your table. Jim, do you, is there a science to it? Do you think? Um, um, I, I would ag agree with you, and, but I don't necessarily have an answer. I think we do, I want to give you one answer, which is to do with, uh, which is to do with um, nostalgia and um, penguin and so on. But uh, I don't know what it is. It's, the, it's a democrat democratizing format, isn't it? I do it? think at least partly a paperback's for one person or a small group of people, and a hardback is a public book, do you think? which is like reflects what happened to this one, that when it went into a library, they hard, made it hardback. And I think a hardback book is a kind of authority that's meant to last, and a paperback book is simply for... Yeah, could, could I challenge that too, in a way, Vanessa? I mean, here, given, given that I have the kind of keys to the medical cabinet in running a publications, whenever there's a commission or a, an internal opportunity for someone to do a book, if you dangle a hardback in front of them, they will all grab it. Um, the cloth-bound, foil-stamped, hard-bound book of their own work is a paradigm above all others. Um, no way would they take a paperback over a, uh, the, the big book. But this, I understand, is a, is a book of images. You know, we're in a school that produces images far, far uh, over uh, a school that endorses words and text. And the vehicle or the vessel that contains an image um, at, a, at the most kind of paradigmatic level, is a cloth-bound, foil-stamped hardback. It's, it's interesting because I spend my life. I mean, I work a lot with graphic designers doing books, and all gra like MM, we we battled for that to be a softback. Of course, the publishers want you to make a hardback because it doesn't cost that much more to produce, but they can sell it for twice as much. And at virtually every single book I make, there's a battle to make it a softback, and the publisher fights back and insists it's a hardback. So. You prefer making Softback, because they're just a bit more interesting. That hardback art books, there's nothing more boring than a big hardback <laughs> art book that costs 40 pounds. It's just, it makes me, you know, whereas if you can use a softback, suddenly you, it becomes a quite interesting proposition. I mean, the number of designers that love the whole earth catalogue, of yeah. course, and that, I mean, that was the model. You know, we're the way of seeing that is the, yeah. one of the ones they fish out of their bags. Yeah. But does that mean the graphic designers are, are, are always going to be caught in a in a kind of retrogressive, um, you know, um, cycle, if they if if these are the, I don't, I don't think it's a necessary retrogressive model. I think you know, I think a big softback book full of information is is not particularly. Yeah. I mean, okay, it happened in the seventies, but it's still relevant yeah. now. Yeah. I don't I don't think it's necessarily retrogressive. And uh, I just wanted, uh, Jim, did you bring any of the the new eighty eightieth anniversary? Um, no, but maybe you could just tell us. I mean, I just wanted to end on this because it's it's so interesting that you've uh, these this new series that you've just launched. Yeah, sorry, I've not got the uh, examples to hand. But um, uh, Penguin Books started in 1935, which makes 80 years old uh, this year. And you know, we thought we'd publish some anniversary stuff. Uh, and uh, at the 60th anniversary, there was a successful series we did um, before my time. Uh, 60 little books for 60p, uh, and they were extremely popular. And we thought, okay, this is a, this is the, the the way to go. And um, so we did. We we've done basically 80 books for 80p. I mean, maybe you've seen them in the shops. I'm not sure, but um, 80p being a, a kind of crazily low price. Interesting what you're saying about uh, cost uh, there, Tom. But but um, they're short stories. They're all 64 pages long, small um, paperback, and uh, they've proved to be really really amazingly popular. Um, the styling echoed some Penguin Classic stuff we've been doing, but basically they also echo um, the very first Penguins with the, with the three panels and so on. So, um, yeah, there's, there's this interest, I think. I'm not sure quite what... I mean, we can all speculate as to what that interest is and why those sell so well, but really, I haven't got an answer. If I was just going to tell you something now, it would be made up. But basically, there's definitely an interest in buying cheap paperbacks that are of, you know, really great works or good quality. So, uh, can I hazard a a, a stab at, at, at that? What, what's interesting about me about this for me is that they feel a little bit like it was what what you were saying, um, Emily, about that certain things work for you on screens or on the Kindles and certain things don't. 
And I'm sure we probably have, all have our own kind of unique parameters as to what, what that is. I mean, certainly for me, it's uh, if I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling, I'm doing the scroll bar and it's moving extremely slowly, I'm just, it's a turn off. It's not going to happen. You know, I want to, I, there's, a certain, there's a certain length beyond which uh, I need it physical. And that's just, and, and that, that's not a hard word count. It's a very personal thing. Um, but what I find interesting about this is as though that 80 pence, it's as though Penguin has gone to the effort of printing out, uh, uh, saving you the effort of, uh, of print, printing this out, um, stapling it, binding it, uh, and giving it to you. And it's all, it almost feels like it's a very interesting, uh, because it's so slim and it's so minimal, uh, it, 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 as, a, as an object, it almost feels like somewhere in hovering between um, something that you would uh, print, uh, print by yourself at home, uh, and perhaps as printers and maybe binding machines become more sophisticated, this won't be uh, too far off, uh, print on demand, um, and then proper publishing. It, it, it seems to inhabit this, this interesting space. Again, a kind of post-digital space where, um, where at, at some level, we're, we're willing to pay a certain amount of, 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 of money um, to have the, the pleasure, uh, and not just the pleasure, but the actuality of, of di digesting content. And I, I find that very kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's very interesting. And also, I think there's a nature of curation that uh, a publisher brings in that, yeah. you know, these are all curated uh, pieces, uh, books, extracts, short stories, and so on. Um, and that's something that a publisher can bring that actually it's quite hard to pull, self, pull, pull together yourself on the internet, you know, that collection of books that you all know are going to say the, the same sort of, uh, give you the same kind of uh, feel. And, and collecting, you know, this thing again that we all love, series and collections of books. It's just, you know, it works. Fantastic. Um, we've run out of time. Thank you so much uh, for coming, giving up your lunch times. Uh, and please join me in, in thanking Emily, Tom, and Jim for a fantastic discussion. Thanks very much.